The Ukrainians are fighting back with pure courage. But the next few days, weeks, and months will be hard on them. Putin has unleashed violence and chaos. But while he may make gains on the battlefield, he'll pay a continuing high price over the long run. And a pound of Ukrainian people, the proud, proud people, pound for pound, ready to fight with every inch of energy they have. They've known 30 years of independence, have repeatedly shown that they will not tolerate anyone who tries to take their country backwards. To all Americans, I'll be honest with you, as I always promised I would be, a Russian dictator of fa invading a foreign country has cost around the world. And I'm taking robust action to make sure the pain of our sanctions is targeted at Russian economy and that we use every tool at our disposal to protect American businesses and consumers. Tonight, I can announce the United States has worked with 30 other countries to release 60 million barrels of oil from reserves around the world. America will lead that effort, releasing 30 million barrels of our own strategic petroleum reserve. And we stand ready to do more if necessary, united with our allies. These steps will help blunt gas prices here at home. But I know news about what's happening can seem alarming to all Americans. But I want you to know we're going to be OK. We're going to be OK. When the history of this era is written, Putin's war in Ukraine will have left Russia weaker and the rest of the world stronger. Well, And while it shouldn't, and while it shouldn't have taken, well, it shouldn't have taken something so terrible for people around the world to see what's at stake. Now everyone sees it clearly. We see the unity among leaders of nations, a more unified Europe, a more unified West. We see unity among the people who are gathering in cities and large crowds around the world, even in Russia, to demonstrate their support for the people of Ukraine. In the battle between democracy and autocracies, democracies are rising to the moment, and the world is clearly choosing the side of peace and security. This is the real test, and it's going to take time. So let us continue to draw inspiration from the iron will of the Ukrainian people to our fellow Ukrainian Americans who forged the deep bond that connects our two nations. We stand with you. We stand with you. Putin may circle Kyiv with tanks, but he'll never gain the hearts and souls of the Iranian people. He'll never, he'll never extinguish their love of freedom, and he will never, never weaken the resolve of the free world. We meet tonight in an America that has lived through two of the hardest years this nation has ever faced. The pandemic has been punishing, and so many families are living paycheck to paycheck, struggling to keep up with the rising cost of food, gas, housing, and so much more. I understand, like many of you did. My dad had to leave his home in Scranton, Pennsylvania, to find work. So like many of you, I grew up in a family when the price of food went up, it was felt throughout the family. It had an impact. That's when one of the first things I did as president was fight to pass the American Rescue Plan. Because people were hurting, we needed to act, and we did. Few pieces of legislation have done more at a critical moment in our history to lift us out of a crisis. It fueled our efforts to vaccinate the nation and combat COVID-19 delivered immediate economic relief to tens of millions of Americans. It helped put food on the table. Remember those long lines of cars waiting for hours just to get a box of food put in their trunk? It cut the cost of health care insurance. And as my dad used to say, it gave the people just a little bit of breathing room. Unlike the $2 trillion tax cut passed in the previous administration that benefited the top 1 percent of Americans, the American Rescue Plan <laughs> The American Rescue Plan helped working people and left no one behind. <laughs> Folks, and it worked. 
It worked. <laughs> it worked. We created jobs, lots of jobs. In fact, our economy created over 6.5 million new jobs just last year. More jobs in one year than ever before in the history of the United States of America. The economy grew at a rate of 5.7 last year, the strongest growth rate in 40 years, and the first step in bringing fundamental change to our economy that hasn't worked for working people in this nation for too long. For the past 40 years, we were told that tax break for those at the top and benefits would trickle down and everyone would, would benefit. But that trickle-down theory led to a weaker economic growth, lower wages, bigger deficits, and a widening gap between the top and everyone else in, in, in nearly a century. Look, <laughs> Vice President Harris and I ran for office, and I realize we have fundamental disagreements on this, but ran for office with a new economic vision for America. Invest in America. Educate Americans. Grow the workforce. Build the economy from the bottom up and the middle out, not from the top down. Because we know. Because we know. Because we know when the middle class grows, when the middle class grows, the poor have a way up and the wealthy do very well. America used to have the best roads, bridges, and airports on Earth. And now, our infrastructure is ranked 13th in the world. We won't be able to compete for the jobs of the 21st century if we don't fix it. That's why it was so important to pass the bipartisan infrastructure law. And I thank my Republican friends who joined to invest and rebuild America, the single biggest investment in history. It was a bipartisan effort, and I want to thank the members of both parties who worked to make it happen. We're done talking about infrastructure weeks. We're now talking about an infrastructure decade. And look, it's going to, it's going to transform America to put us in a path to win the economic competition of the 21st century that we face with the rest of the world, particularly China. I've told Xi Jinping it's never been a good bet to bet against the American people. We'll create good jobs for millions of Americans, modernizing roads, airports, ports, waterways, all across America. And we'll do it to withstand the devastating effects of climate change and promote environmental justice. We'll build a national network of 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations begin to replace the poisonous lead pipes so every child, every American, has clean water to drink at home and at school. We're going to provide, provide affordable, high-speed internet for every American, rural, suburban, urban, and tribal communities. 4,000 projects have already been announced. Many of you have announced them in your districts. And tonight, I'm announcing that this year, we will start fixing over 65,000 miles of highway and 1,500 bridges in disrepair. And folks, when we use taxpayers' dollars to rebuild America, we're going to do it by buying America. Buy American products. Support American jobs. The federal government spends about $600 billion a year to keep this country safe and secure. There's been a law on the books for almost a century to make sure taxpayers' dollars support American jobs and businesses. Every administration, Democrat and Republican, says they'll do it. But we're, actu we're actually doing it. We'll buy America to make sure every, everything from the deck of an aircraft carrier to the steel on highway guardrails is made in America from beginning to end. All of it. All of it. But, folks, to compete for the jobs 
of the future, we also need a loving playing field with China and other competitors. That's why it's so important to pass the Bipartisan Innovation Act sitting in Congress that will make record investments in emerging technologies and American manufacturing. We used to invest almost 2 percent of our GDP in research and development. We don't now. Can't. China is. Let me give you one example why it's so important to pass. If you travel 20 miles east of Columbus, Ohio, you'll find 1,000 empty acres of land. It won't look like much. But if you stop and look closely, you'll see a field of dreams, the ground in which America's future will be built. That's where Intel, the American company that helped build Silicon Valley, is going to build a $20 billion semiconductor megasite, up to eight state-of-the-art factories in one place, 10,000 new jobs. And in those factories, the average job about $135 $135,000 a year. Some of the most sophisticated manufacturing in the world to make com computer chips the size of a fingertip, the power of the world in everyday lives, from smartphones, technology, to the internet, technology is yet to be invented. But that's just the beginning. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger, who is here tonight, I don't know where Pat is. Pat, there you go. Pat, stand up. Pat. Pat came to see me, and he told me they're ready to increase their investment from $20 billion to $100 billion. That would be the biggest investment in manufacturing in American history. And all they're waiting for is for you to pass this bill. So let's not wait any longer. Send it to my desk. I'll sign it and will really take off in a big way. And folks, Intel is not alone. There's something happening in America. Just look around and you'll see an amazing story. The rebirth of pride that comes from stamping products made in America. The revitalization of American manufacturing. Companies are choosing to build new factories here when just a few years ago they would have gone overseas. That's what's happening. Ford is investing $11 billion in electric vehicles, creating 11,000 jobs across the country. GM is making the largest investment in its history, $7 billion to build electric vehicles, creating 4,000 jobs in Michigan. All told, 369,000 new manufacturing jobs were created in America last year alone. Folks, powered by people I've met like Jojo Burgess from generations of union steelworkers in Pittsburgh, who's here tonight. Where are you, Jojo? There you go. Thanks, buddy. As Ohio, as Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown says. As Sherrod Brown says, it's time to bury the label Rust Belt. It's time to see the, the, what used to be called the Rust Belt become the, 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 the home of a significant resurgence of manufacturing. And with all the bright spots in our economy, record job growth, higher wages, too many families are struggling to keep up with their bills. Inflation is robbing them of gains they thought otherwise they would be able to feel. I get it. That's why my top priority is getting prices under control. Look, our economy roared back faster than almost anyone predicted. But the pandemic meant that businesses had a hard time hiring enough people because of the pandemic to keep up production in their factories. So you didn't have people making those beams that went into buildings because they were out. The factory was closed. The panic also disrupted the global supply chain. Factories close. When that happens, it takes longer to make goods and get them to the warehouses, to the stores, and go, prices go up. Look at cars last year. One-third of all the inflation was because of automobile sales. 
There weren't enough semiconductors to make all the cars that people wanted to buy. And guess what? Prices of automobiles went way up, especially used vehicles as well. And so we have a choice. One way to fight inflation is to drive down wages and make Americans poorer. I think I have a better idea to fight inflation. Lower your costs, not your wages. And folks, that means make more cars and semiconductors in America, more infrastructure and innovation in America, more goods moving faster and cheaper in America, more jobs where you can earn a good living in America. Instead of relying on foreign supply chains, let's make it in America. Look.